that would be the winning combination. Somebody like Macho Man that come in, you know, the great player that can all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm going to crush everybody in this game. What's up, everyone? Today we've got the mastermind behind many of the high stakes poker shows poker tournaments as well i'm not actually sure but i know mastermind of high stakes poker and poker after dark and all that stuff one of the most well-known poker producers and president of poker go uh, mori Iskandani. did i pronounce that right mori Iskandani. yes you did perfect all right, because I think I think um, I've got it wrong a couple of times before. Did you also produce a lot of the uh, torments uh, torment showings as well? Well, I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. Well, uh, I've been producing World Series of Poker. I guess that's uh, <laughs> that's a tournament. But uh, yes, we we had uh, Heads Up Championship for NBC. That was one of the uh, very first mm-hmm. tournaments. You know that. Uh, my company produced and I always hate to say I produce anything it it really is never I in production world anybody that works the production world knows that it's just a combination of everyone coming together from technical and experience and uh, stamina uh, to make it happen some some days uh, can go 18 19 hours and uh, it's just impossible if you don't have a really good crew so uh uh, I never ever want to say that what happened in my production life, it was about me. It's just, I was such a small percentage of it and I'm not trying to be humble. It is the truth. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's pretty easy to like forget about all the people that go into makings of various things. Um, and a lot of different things in life. Uh, production makes a lot of sense because that's massive team effort. Um, so you started out uh, actually playing poker, and in fact, you were born in Iran. I don't think most people know that. I didn't know that. Um, so can you tell us a bit about uh, what it was like going from Iran to the U.S.? Well, um, my favorite way of summing it up in poker terms is that I was born in Azerbaijan of Iran. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and then I was uh, raised in Tehran, uh, which is the capital of uh, Iran now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was re-raised in Portland, Oregon uh, when I was a teenager. That's where I moved to. And I was Czech-raised in Las Vegas most of my life. So that's that pretty much... Uh, Wait, did you say Czech-raised? <laughs> Czech-raised in Las Vegas since 1984. Uh, So most of my life I've lived in in Vegas and uh, pretty much all of my life, uh, you know, ever since uh, since out of college, it's been nothing but poker. What does check raise mean? What what do you mean by this? Uh, Check raise. I mean, where else do you get check raise? You only get check raise in Las Vegas. Nowhere else do people check raise you. (laughs) When I moved to Vegas, I moved in to play poker and uh, I was check raised quite a few number of times <laughs> it made does, me learn. does that mean like surprised or what no just just the reason i moved to vegas was to play poker so um, that part of my life uh you know the, the reason i moved to portland was go to school um oh, I see. study and do a lot of you know a lot of um, you know business that we had in mind in uh, in the 70s And then uh, come 80s, and, uh, you know, the whole world had changed, my world anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, with the revolution happening at home, losing my father, losing the business, pretty much going, you know, from someone who had everything as a teenager and a very bright future to uh, uh, what am I going to do with the six months late notice on my apartment (laughs) for rent? So, uh, uh yeah, it's, it, it was, uh, let's say, interesting times. Well, that would, uh, it makes for a good story. I suppose that's true. Um, yeah. So, 
I, I understand Iran is like I would think that there's not really much poker in Iran because it's very religious. Um, usually these places. I'm just curious how you got into poker because uh, I, I read that at the age of seven you tore up a shoebox to make cards, <laughs> and that, well, it seems like you must have got into it early. Of course, depending on your family, you know, like yes, they were playing. Plenty of people were playing poker in in Iran or Persia, as, as many people call it uh, sometimes. Um, even two of the world champions, World Series of Poker champions, are Persians. Hamid Dasmalchi and Mansour Matloubi. They were all both Iranians. Oh, so right. for a country that has such a small population uh, or percentage of poker players, it is amazing that we actually have two WSOP uh, main event champions. Um, yeah, I mean, it it, uh, it depended. It, it there were a lot of gaming. There were even casinos uh, when uh, I was in, in my teenage years in in nineteen sixties and uh, and early seventies. Uh, but it wasn't allowed in our house. So uh, my cousin uh, showed me how to take make um, uh, playing cards out of a out of a shoebox so we cut them we made them and he t- he taught me how to play poker and it was a strip deck by the way so um there was six and six and above what 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 is short deck now it's being known uh, that was my first education and he, he he taught me how to play the game and believe it or not we played all night and i was seven years old but it was all closed card five card you know Every all, all what what kid doesn't like to learn how to bluff? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they just, you know, like if if you take bluff out of the game, there's no game. So it was all about let's see if you can bluff. Yeah, it, it was um, uh, it, it was a very very uh, um, how would I say early education, but it really didn't come to me until um, I was in college at Portland. And in Vancouver, Washington, there were card rooms there. That's where I really got introduced to poker. So I knew the principle of poker, but I did not know the the stud part of it, or you know, or or hold them part and all that was uh, in college in uh, Vancouver, mm-hmm. Washington. Um. So it sounds like you played short deck, like at seven years old. Is that right? I did. I did play short deck seven years old. Again, it was very, very rudimentary. You know, like this is a full house. This is, you know, like I learned the hierarchy of the hands very quickly. So uh, outside of that, uh, no strategy or any kind. It's not like I played in high school. Uh, We we hardly ever played poker uh, until um, I was in poker. And I was fascinated. The first first game that I learned to play was five card stud, and it was absolutely fascinating. I, I thought, you know, this is, yeah, it was. I was I couldn't wait for the weekend to arrive so I could run out there play twenty five cents Annie, and uh, uh, one and two dollar limit, uh, seven card stud, and believe it or not, I remember one night winning five hundred dollars. <laughs> one and two dollar five card stuff. Just imagine that. Imagine hands. Imagine how hard I got hit with the deck <laughs> to win five hundred dollars. Well, yeah. maybe they're really bad. Also, I don't know um, what these guys must be playing. Like maybe this like can't fold or something. I uh, should ask. Well, I want to ask. What was so fascinating about it? Reading people. I mean, to me, just it, it, it was. I knew some people had that gift. I knew like they had a tell on me. Sometimes I got called, you know, as the newcomer and you start, you know, studying yourself and studying other people and, and, and thinking, wow, uh, how interesting is this? You know, there's something inside of you just has to, uh, you know, connect with the other person and try to uh, put the pieces together. So to me, uh, it wasn't about math at all. Of course, math a really big part as I learned, you know, like uh, especially in, in uh, Texas Hold'em and uh, Seven Card Stud, uh, it be, you know, it was complex math. It wasn't as, you know, as simple and clear as Five Card Stud. 
But still, reading part of it, you know, like uh, getting together and I say, you know, in, in, in at the poker table and having, you know, certain people that you played over and over and picking up on something that they just never knew you picked up was fascinating. And uh, that part of poker is, to me right now, is sliding a little bit and it's kind of hard to see. It's, it's, it's become more of a mm-hmm. solver's game. Uh, I feel like um, the old days poker was uh, driving an F1 formula car and where, you know, you had to change gears and stop at the right time or speed up at the time. And now they're saying, it's all right, it's got, we got it. They got it. The car can drive itself, you know, just <laughs> sit in there and, and uh, type in these codes. And there you go. It's just different products. I feel uh, a lot of the players that are playing now, they, they, they're so advanced as part of, you know, how the game is played in different level that I grew up with. Sometimes um, I'm, I hope that I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I, I'm just not an expert in that area. You probably know a lot more than me if it is true or not. If, if we have a chance, if I have a chance playing against someone that's uh, uh, a GTO wizard, <laughs> I, I don't know if I do or not. I, I don't know if I'm completely sold, but I sure, I, I know it's something that I need to learn all over again if I ever retire and get back to poker again. Yeah, yeah, it's changed really a lot. But uh, if you play in some soft games, you can get away with. You don't really have to know all the theory and all of that. You just need to know like some baselines, and it's cool. Um, so, what made you decide to become a producer? Uh, because uh, I understand after playing for thirty years, you decided to produce shows. What's up with that? Or how did you get into that? Just like most things in life, uh, you, you know, things that you don't plan. Uh, it, or what shapes your life. It wasn't like I was never planning in my wildest dream that I was going to be a, a television producer of any kind. I was perfectly happy playing poker. I had my own time and, uh, you know, uh, freedom, as you well know, of poker players enjoy. Uh, and by sheer luck, I was introduced or I started or, or someone just ran their path, ran by my path in 1987 in California, where stud became uh, legal. California were all closed games and they didn't consider stud being a uh, quote unquote uh, uh, skill game. And once that got legalized, it was amazing. Uh, the, a lot of uh, pros from Vegas, we used to uh, drive over to California and just play uh, Hold'em and Stud, which was, you know, the games were incredible. And I uh, ran into a gentleman named Henry Ornstein, who passed away last year uh, at age 96. And he was still playing, uh, you know, seven card stud and, uh, you know, with, with a bunch of friends. Uh, Henry uh, was a visionary. He was not from world and he knew that uh, the game that uh, you know we are, we are so used to uh, so easily came to us and so was it was so exciting for us was nothing but boring uh, television where when he saw it on ESPN and uh, he could see that the, with uh, basically showing the whole cards, if you could somehow show players whole cards, that could capture the audience. Just like any industry, people within that industry don't have the vision to see outside group, you know, like what they want to see, what gets them, you know, uh, excited and motivated to uh, uh, join and watch poker, for example, a game that came so naturally to all of us in the poker world was quite different. Like we enjoyed poker. We didn't have to see uh, each other's whole cards playing to get our juices flowing. Like we we tried to read each other and um, uh, play the game in, you know, in a level that pros play or even uh, good recreational players play. Didn't really require to see whole cards. As a matter of fact, it required for you to protect your whole cards. But when it came to TV, showing 
that element on TV didn't make any sense. So Henry Ornstein, uh, he he obviously saw that clearly that you know like without ball cards, you don't have a game for television. And once the whole cards came in and you could see audience rooting for a river card for their favorite player or gasping for air when a $300,000 bluff was shoved to see what the outcome was going to be, uh, everyone knew, you know, the, the, the man that started the Transformers just transformed poker into a general audience and made it like a television show. Um, I was one of the pros that even at that time, even though I was working very closely with him and I was his confidant and uh, partner, uh, getting the whole cards going and getting the TV show started, I didn't have his confidence and I didn't know if the players are going to actually agree to show their whole cards. And uh, Henry said, don't worry, you put the camera in front of people, you can ask them to do many things. <laughs> he was right again. Uh, I mean, it's not that valuable. Like, who cares, really? I mean, like, maybe people play different on TV. Like, I don't know. I haven't gotten so much information off people from TV. Like, I can't really. Uh, I haven't gotten, like, a wealth of info watching people. I don't even have time, really, to watch too much TV, frankly. Not even that. I mean, look, nobody's probably seen in a uh, poker hand me. And uh, our senior producer, who's been with me for a good 15, 16 years, Dan Gotti, he put it in a really good uh, uh, form for me. He said it's like watching a maze from above. You can see how they got out. And they drop you in there. You're still lost. So, you know, like watching poker on TV with whole cards, it's not exactly going to make you a world beater because you're watching all the greatest players play. When you jump into the in the table playing with them, you're still going to be lost. You know, like the choices are A, B, C, D, E, F. You know, you name it. You don't know which one. You know, they're which gear they're on. And uh, uh, and he was right. I mean, you still have to get in there and play and get the feel with different players um, to become a better player. But Obviously, watching, you know, with whole cards is going to help you. You know, you're going to pick some nuggets from each show. It's mm -hmm. valuable, but it, it's not the final solution. Well, someone would have probably done it at some point. Also, so there's that. I mean, right? Like, kind of. So a lot of things are sort of inevitable in, in some kind of way. Um, at least that's how I look at it. Like, if that needs there, someone's going to make it. Yep. Uh, yeah. I recall. I recall uh, when we talked before, um, I like gave you an idea, and you said to me that a bunch of different ideas have been pitched, and for whatever reason, a lot of them haven't gone through or just weren't really that popular or something like that. I forget. I forget what you said with regards to that. Well, you know, once poker became popular on TV, mm -hmm. everyone had ideas. You know, everyone would come. You uh, and most of these people that came with ideas were not from poker world. You know, they were from uh, television world, from production world. Oh, really? But they didn't realize that us playing poker, you know, for so many years, for decades, there wasn't an idea that we didn't think about. If there was something, you know, like we could do any kind of a gimmick, uh, we had thought about it, but. We even tried some gimmicks. You know, we uh, uh, tried uh, some things that made sense for us to do. But it came out after uh, all the trials and errors. Uh, it boiled down to, you know what? You should just keep the game pure as it is. You can't take the game like basketball and try to make a gimmick and uh, have it become successful. People want to see the best player play the game. And that's what's going to sell. And that's what they're interested in. So uh, we've done gimmicks, yes. But am I uh, uh, a proponent of gimmicks, uh, gimmicky poker? I'm not. It just it just hasn't worked. And I don't think it will. Hmm. Uh, okay. I'm kind of curious to explore myself. But I can see that being true. It's hard to replace the simple 
the best watch the best play and that's it sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, I, I think the closest we ever came to a gimmick that made sense was doubles poker championship, where uh, pros took turn playing different streets. So if you and I were partners in the game against playing two other uh, players, you played the you played before the flop, I played the flop, you played the turn, I played the river. So, yeah. uh, and then sometimes, like before I make my decision, we had like one chance of consulting and we actually filmed that so you could hear the player saying what should i do here whatever should i go for the bluff or should i go for value bet whatever it was and um you know i mean we thought that was going to be pretty popular and it wasn't like it it, it was rejected by all but people didn't people just said you know what just let me see them play straight poker one man you know per hand and uh, uh let the battle go that way instead of you know trying to be a partner yeah, I guess, I guess uh, you know, when you're at, yeah, I guess it's easy to, like, think that people might want something that uh, you might not want, but I guess people want the same stuff a lot. I guess it makes quite a bit of sense. I don't know. Yeah, it's, look, people, when you think of something, uh, you're fascinated by it. It's always like that. You know, it, it's not, I mean, I remember, in, again, going back to the 1980s, I kept thinking, you know, like, we're games people. Why is it that we haven't come up with a game that we could sell? I mean, we have to be better than people that are not from the gaming world, like us, putting stuff in Toys R Us and other stores and, and you know, like Transformers, like Henry, uh, making these games or toys and, you know, making a lot of money. So I came up with this idea. I thought it was genius. I was so excited. And it was basically playing chess with dice. I called it dice chess. Where just, you know, a, a, a die happens to have six sides and there's six pieces of chess game. So I came up with this whole thing, did a write-up, and got all the way to a point that I wanted to do a, a patent. And when I hired a patent attorney, he, he did a search and came back. He said, Maury, there's 864 similar ideas. <laughs> and I was thinking, I just thought of something that nobody else did. Oh, and, yeah. People thought of all sorts of shit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, look at chess. Has chess changed? No. I mean, everyone tried to bring some gimmicks to chess, but people want to just see the game in its pure form. Same thing is true about, I think, all the games. Not, not just poker, but anything else that's like in this pure form, that's what is fascinating to a lot of people. I don't really get it myself, frankly, um, but okay. I, I kind of want to research why this is, but I'll, I'll figure that out on my own, I guess. So this just seems a little strange to me. Um, yeah, I just don't work the same as other people, perhaps. I, I want to ask, uh, did you, I read that you had many uh, business experiences before did they help with this production company because I, I would think going into production is not like that easy it seems like quite a complicated business um well i did have business experiences before i graduated you know uh, with a business degree and um, i helped you know in my father's business uh, which was an import and export so I, I had, you know, some basic ideas, you know, how to, uh, uh, how to work with people, how to get people motivated, and things like that. That's kind of for business, but um, production business that I got involved. Like I said, I had so many people help me. Yes, did I go into. Uh, uh, studios and sat with editors uh, two shifts at a time, literally going 90 hours a week, you know, trying to learn exactly how you're going to, uh, how, what, 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 how do they cut the shows? How do they edit the shows? Here we are, we film something for eight hours and we are trying to make two hours of TV out of it. Um, especially with high stakes poker, I really got involved. And uh, because I was a cash game player, I wanted to make, or this was done right and was coming out the way it was supposed to. And believe it or not, in the er early years of high, high stakes, if I go back with the knowledge that I have right now, uh, I would leave so little on the cutting board. 
because yeah. the conversations and everything else was fast. But here we are, you know, like the network wants 13 episodes from three days from 24 hours that they played. And um, I, I was trying to help the editors to put that together. And I would watch the whole 24 hours and literally like put pins on where you go in, where you come out, all that good stuff. Uh, with with today's knowledge, I would probably keep 80% instead of 50% or 40% in some cases. You would um, what? Like I would, I would have kept, you know, like for, for example, a 24, a 24 hour uh, uh, play, they played eight hours a day for three days. So 24 hours became 13, 44 minutes. So better than like 60% was gone. Like I had, I had to pick and choose. Um, I mean, now some people might argue, no, 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 that's what made it good. You know, it was highlights of, you know, like big hands, but you don't have to, have, you know, poker, you, you, you know, it. you play in a game that's fun. You're never, you're never tired. You can, you can watch the whole thing. And uh, as a matter of fact, that has happened in the, you know, in some of our shows. When we went into poker after dark mode, we kept 80%, 85% of the hands they played. And people still you know, admired Poker After Dark. And there was a lot of followers, you know, like actually made, it went into more countries than any other shows, Poker After Dark. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, what I was saying, you're, you're saying, how did you get into the production business? I learned how to produce. But the business of production, it wasn't like I bought TV trucks or cameras or anything else. Uh, I had a lot of, pros that i basically partnered up with and they help produce the shows with me giving them guidance you know like what poker is all about so um uh, yeah it was a, it was it, it's a difficult business if you're uh, especially now um uh, I, I just want to go back and say you know like i was talking about luck plays always a big role in in my, it has played in my life that's for sure but in many people's life what you don't expect makes you successful or brings something forward and uh production to me as a poker player came by pure accident running into uh, henry ornstein in 1985 and uh, in 1995 we were working together put a poker table together with whole cards and fast forward in 2015, my company uh, being bought out by uh, Poker Central, uh, which uh, Carrie Katz is behind. And again, I ran into somebody that had great passion for, for the game and the means to support it. And he bought my company. And all of a sudden, we went from production to production and distribution. So that's a lot harder believe it or not, just producing something, okay? Like if people came to me with ideas, I said, okay, go sell it and I'll produce it. Uh, if you came up with some, you know, hey, let's do this this tournament, this, that tournament. So, okay, go to sell it to a network, sell it to, a, a, you know, uh, some distribution company and I'll produce it. So uh, believe it or not, it was a lot easier. But now we are producing and we are distributing. We have... Poker Go subscription channel. We have several OTTs, you know, the digital channels like YouTube and, and you know, so it becomes a lot different strategy. Like what you're producing, you're also thinking, you know, okay, this has to distribute well for us to make money. Oh, I see. I see. I see work both ends of. Uh... I'm still learning. Believe it or not, I'm still learning every day. There's not a day go by that I don't learn something new. Luckily, I'm surrounded by a lot more by smarter people <laughs> than me, and uh, uh, so things are fine. Things are w working out smoothly. Do you have a um, Do you have like a favorite show that you produced? Well, <clears throat> it's easy for me to say uh, my favorite show is High Stakes Poker because to this day I'm still involved. You know, producing it, still involved sitting down in the voice room and voicing it and, and, you know, with the talent and getting it going. Uh, but uh, going back to the uh, earlier years of high stakes, 
I actually was the person that would contact players. I was actually the person that would try to bring the lineup that I I would I would you know was, was familiar with and I knew would make good banter between the players and it would be like exciting a game for the people to watch. Uh, players like Tom Duan. Uh, they didn't need, you know, I wasn't at the mercy of the cards to have a good show because I knew with uh, his playing style, you combine it with Antonio's Fandiaris and uh, and uh, uh, Doyle and, you know, different styles, like even going back to Gila Liberté, recreational players, Jerry Buss, you know, from uh, Lakers. Um, you know, like I knew this combination was going to be a pretty good game. Nowadays, I'm not familiar with a lot of players. So uh, thankfully, I have Branch Hanks, who knows a lot of the modern day players. I mean, yes, there's some of the old school players who still come in, but uh, he does pretty much the invitations. He puts the show together. But I try to get involved when the shows are formatted and coming out and for, for The Voice to still make it entertaining and make it so it is not real technical poker. It's the kind of poker that you can grab your beer and sit on your couch. And watch. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a lot of what's needed more these days is, is not so much like technical, um, strategy, like how, what percent you should check raise on the turn and all that stuff. Uh, that's what I would think would make a good show is more something that looks like fun to watch and, has some shit talk or something. Um, you would know better than me. What is it that would attract a wider audience to poker, and what is it that the audience is actually looking for? Same thing. Same thing that that, that a railbird is attracted to. I mean, if in the old days when I was playing at Caesar's Palace, there was no must move games, so you pretty much sold your game to recreational players. There could be I played seven card stud, and uh, it was a very you know it was pretty much the only game that everybody played. And we would have like 10, 15, 30, or uh, 30, 60 games going at Caesar's Palace. Just way back, seven card stuff. And a recreational player, a tourist would walk into the poker room. Which game do you think they would pick? If there was a seat open in six different games, they would naturally go to a game that everybody was laughing, high-fiving, you know, like, okay, that was the exciting game. Same thing is uh, true for television audience. I always think of them as railbirds. They're going to watch a game that is fun to watch. They're not going to watch a game that everybody's quiet and you can you might as well have their cardboards cut out and put there and, and nobody knows if <laughs> you know like if they're real players or not. Nobody's going to you know get get. Uh, uh, spend a lot of time watching something that is boring and that can that can quickly become the case if you don't have the right lineup in these cash games oh really okay i would think that uh what matters is just the creation of many different emotions I, i'm not sure if i'm right about this but if like so even if someone gets like really angry or really sad for example um or like loses a lot of money I would think that people would like to watch that more than they'd like to watch something, a game where everyone's just stoic, or am I just wrong? That is so true. I, I heard this uh, from a very talented producer, that they could drop you in the middle of a square, and in four corners of the square, something is happening. In one corner, Tiger Woods is hitting chip shots. Another corner, Tom Brady is, is, throwing, basket, is throwing passes to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, throwing football. And the other corner, Michael Jordan is taking, you know, uh, throw, you know, like playing basketball or throwing hoops and three-pointers, whatever. And in another corner, two total strangers are in the fight. The fight breaks up between two total strangers. You will see 90% of the people watching that corner. <laughs> Here's all these famous, you know, uh, well-known... Uh, <laughs> folks doing their craft and yet you're more you know prone to get dragged into uh, watching two, two guys going and that is pretty much a television rule you can't have you can have all the greatest famous poker players sitting there and playing not saying a word and then 
you can bring in total strangers that go at it in, in a much smaller game, but you know, like a controversy that can break out and they're going at it. And sure enough, like everybody wants to watch that. So uh, obviously it would be better if you could have them both. If you have great players that also know, you know, how to uh, make the game fun, that would be the winning combination. Right, right. Well, that's what I've been aiming to do is try Somebody like Macho Man that come in, you know, the great player that can all of a sudden says, you know what, I'm going to crush everybody in this game. <laughs> so you, you, you understand that better than most. Um, oh, well, yeah, I just decided it'd be like, yeah, I mean, most poker players are quite humble. I mean, poker teaches you to be humble in many ways. And, to, and it rewards people that have a very, um, what's the word? very honest view of their skills. It's not a good idea uh, to think you're better than how you are. So most people end up being that way, but they also be, end up being very boring. So, um, yeah, that was kind of my idea behind that. But uh, one thing I realized from at least uh, actually doing a little bit of research on wrestling is that a lot of these uh, wrestling fights have all these backstories and people are, are betraying each other and all this drama and all this nonsense and like poker feels like it could have i mean i don't know about the betraying and it does have that too basically i'm happy to like throw out some names and cause some drama about people that have uh, stolen money <laughs> from me or anyone else i'm totally happy to stir up some drama about that because i think they f deserve it frankly i feel like that could, element could be thrown in there certainly it can be painted as like a story even if it's not really true a lot of the time i think that would be Make it more entertaining to watch, but maybe you have uh, some other thoughts on all this. Well, look, I'm hoping at some point technology uh, advanced enough and players get relaxed enough mm -hmm. that combination of new technology and, and the players uh, can create a lot bigger uh, uh, interaction, sort of. Not even though it's a one-way interaction, but just imagine if, you, if they could hear your thoughts. When you were yeah. doing the table, hearing it, um, we tried to do something, you know, like rudimentary a little bit, not not exactly, you, you know, we, we just tried in a few years back to put a camera behind a player and say, listen, be, before you act, you can turn around to the, to, the, to the mic and say something that everybody, the audience is hearing it on TV, but the table is and um, I, I put that behind the player that I thought would be very successful and very natural for him to do it, and it still didn't work. All, all he had to do was turn around and say, I'm going to block Gondelman and uh, watch him fold. Or, I'm, or saying that I think he's only got two forwards. And, uh, you know, like, let me see if I can move him out of it. And if he was correct, I think he's only got two forwards. Can you imagine, you know, being a viewer somebody read the read the other person so perfectly and make the right play that could have been like pretty cool so uh so far i haven't seen it done you know correctly and smoothly without you know like interrupting the game or uh you know players being comfortable to do it but maybe someday it can happen it doesn't sound that hard to do to some extent like if you're bluffing someone obviously you don't say it in the middle of the hand but you say it after, you could say, like, well, I put you on two fours. And if they had two fours, it, it would just be, like, a matter of building that habit, I would think. I mean, I, I'm thinking to myself, as you're saying it, while I'm thinking of calling, I can say this. While I'm thinking of raising, I can say some things. And if I bluff someone, I could, if I'm, if my habit's built enough, my awareness is built enough, it feels realistic to say. But I think uh, I would personally have to be reminded a few times to get it right. Because it'd be really hard to like think of these sorts of things to like say this on top of like facing a difficult decision. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, could I'll, be done. Huh? I'll hold you to it. Next time you're playing, all right. Show producing, I'm going to show you a trick that you can talk to your audience, and okay. let's see how well you pull it off. Nobody all at right. the table is going to hear it, and our producers are going to know that you're getting ready to say something. So okay. We'll make sure your mic is adjusted correctly and talk to the audience and let's see okay. how it works. i'll look into the camera and talk to the audience it'll be funny like this is you this don't even have to, we don't even uh, have to look at the camera but I'll, I'll show you the trick 
the next time you're playing. Maybe maybe at the final table of the World Series this year. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll look into the camera. Uh, this this sounds fun to me because all these weird like things that uh, like talking. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. These like strange social situations are up my alley. Uh, no. So I'm into it. Just shout, Jungle Man, say what you're thinking. And uh, that'll, that'll get me on cue or like, I don't know, we'll add like a special pen or a sign or something like that. It'll be good. Um, don't worry. Don't worry. I know exactly what to do. So next time I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to remind you, hey, we, we were going to try something to see if it works. And I think you'll be very okay. good at it. All right. Uh, I think um, last time I'm thinking, I'm not sure how we got on this one subject. We were talking about legalizing poker in, in California. Maybe this was because this will be good for poker. Maybe this is like what poker needs is just like more legalization. Or am I uh, a little confused here? I Look, forget how we got on that topic. Perfect combination of uh, elements that absolutely put poker on steroids in uh, 2007. You know that era was obviously the whole cams, you know, and making making it popular on TV. Then here comes the internet, and now everyone had a chance to watch something on TV and practice at home. Just go on the internet and play for real money. Uh, many college students, you know, like you, you could just imagine the scenario. You're you're, but they're all getting ready to go to uh, uh, clubbing, you know, like Friday night, and then there's one friend sitting there and playing and somebody says, Hey, what are you doing? So I'm in a tournament that, you know, cost me $10 and I can win like 1800. And all of a sudden, like eight or nine, 10, this is they're all just fascinated. And they're watching him, sweating him and forget the nightclub. This is more fun. All that went away. All that with uh, internet shutting down and poker not being legal went away. So it is, it is important to bring that back. And it is disappointing to see that sports betting came three years ago, and it's in 30 states. And poker has been struggling all this time, and we are enforced. So, and we are still waiting for some of the big states like California that's really used to be pretty much, you know, quarter of uh, all the people playing on the Internet in the world. And still, you know, debating going back and forth. It's it's come up for votes, and every time it comes in, whether it runs into problems with the Indian reservation or uh, or things that I don't know, whatever that happens, it just doesn't pass. So, if somehow poker was moving along alongside of sports betting, and it was coming to uh, many of the states and becoming, you know, like a national uh, becoming legal to play nationally, you know, where states can, you know, have liquidity, meaning you know, everyone can play. You know, you don't have to be in a state only the, your state. You, can, you could people from Nevada could play anywhere else. You know, play New Jersey, play uh, Michigan right now, and and go on playing all these other states. Of course, it can come back, and it can come back a lot bigger. All I'm hearing these days is how much it's growing. And you don't see it in the U.S. because, yeah, it's growing everywhere else. Texas Hold'em is growing in Germany, not in Texas. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like so weird. Um, yeah, it, it would be a huge boost for uh, poker if it comes back again. And this time, you know, with all the legal... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a bit curious why. I mean, I suspect it's just money oriented. I mean, it's it's clearly not because. I mean, it just seems insane to think that sports betting isn't gambling, but poker is gam. Like what? Like no. Like you can actually. There's a really very real chance of people making money from poker, whereas in many sports, it's it's very difficult to make money. It's like impossible. In fact, yeah. uh, like NBA totals, I know is unbeatable, and then. You know, you're up against like people with all these statistical models, whereas that's not necessarily true in poker. I mean, yeah, you can play against these all the internet guys and their sims, simulations, and whatever, but it's not the same as playing, you know, betting sports against someone with who's, who's like you know spent all this money developing models and 
all the shit, and you have to beat the bookies who are really good, and that kind of thing, where you can just play Look, your own game. Hmm? I love it. I love it that sports bet in 30 states. I think it's beautiful. I mean, I, I, I bet sports. I'm not a sports better, but it sure makes the game a lot more fun, just like anything else. And you know this better than most people out there. There's not a game that you can't gamble on. And yours truly has gambled on holding his breath, <laughs> running against someone, playing volleyball, basketball, you name it, and we've gambled on. Monopoly, doesn't matter. You can gamble on any game, any time. There's going to be very small percentage of the society that would have problem with that, just like they have problem drinking. That doesn't mean you can just say, okay, stop everything. It can't happen. The truth of the matter is 99% of the people are going to play a $5 tournament on Friday night and have a ball. And it's going to be just the greatest roller coaster they've been on. And that one time they make the final table of the tournament, is they're never going to forget the rest of their life. And it's not going to make any difference than them going to Disneyland. Look, if you if you just got hooked on going to Disneyland every night, you go broke. Those rides are expensive. <laughs> but if you're going there like, you know, twice a year, you're having a ball. And that's what, you know, I mean, maybe a bad example I'm giving. But if you're, if you're have, if you have control over your life that you're supposed to, nothing is more pleasant than play poker. I mean, it's just, there's just, so much to the game that's pleasant. It uh, reminds me, it feels like, I mean, if you look at it in a certain way, like everything is kind of a gamble. You just, you view everything as sort of like a currency that you're wagering, like your time or, you know, your like efforts or, you know, your money and other things. Or, you know, if you go to college, you're like gambling on your future. If you don't go to college, you're, you're not gambling on your future. If you go to Disneyland, you're like taking a pretty good gamble, but you're still like gambling on your time and you're uh, in a way that's like not exactly attractive, but uh, you're spending your money on your time in a way that you think you're going to get fun out of it sort of thing. And then you have to pay it later. You think it's a good investment sort of. It's kind of ironic, in my opinion. And it's really ironic that people care that much what other people do. This I don't really understand. But I want to ask, what's uh, what's the future hold for you? Uh, you got any shows coming up? Any big plans? Going to play some more poker? Well, uh, I, I definitely miss playing. I've been playing some mixed games uh, just to learn them. And, and to me, like, any new form of poker is fascinating to learn. But uh, I'm, I'm also, you know, like I, I was always a limit player my, all my life. And transitioning to no limit, uh, that alone, even though like I know this, this, this might come across really weird to a lot of people. Like this guy is producing all these games. What is he, so dense that he just never learned? It doesn't work that way. Yes, I watch you guys play. I see what you're doing. And, if, and it looks easy. And like I said, you jump in there and play. It's a different game. No limit holder, fascinating. I mean, it really is. I've gotten to this age, and I started playing like in the last three years more and more, getting into the game and playing with different people, and just sit in the game and watch everyone and try and say, what a different game than limit this game is. It's just different world, completely different world. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm Hoping to play a little more and more No Limit Hold. I can't play in any of the games that you produce. That that's that's just goes without saying. I'm never going to play anything that be producing. Um, I have access to way too much, you know, uh, areas of the production. Uh, not too many people have the kind of access I have. So to me, having that kind of access and playing is, is does absolutely doesn't make any sense. Um, but um, the future, you know, this this is a game. This is this is not a fact. This is not poker has been around for over a thousand years, or maybe maybe two thousand years. It's not going anywhere. It's just growing. Just you just have to give it give it the proper uh, uh, boost 
we have to hope the legislators come around and uh, help to put good rules and laws in place. And if they don't do it, just undergrounds are going to take over. We don't want that. We want players to um, play good, honest game. We don't want like, every little news that you come up from one player it puts us back so many years because politicians, people that are against poker, they're always going to bring those cases forward. You know that. And, and the stereotype is going to happen. Yo, you play poker, it's going to be uh, this and that. Just like the old movies, you always saw aces in somebody's sleeve. And, you know, like telling them that's not the poker. You know, that's something you saw in the old movies. Today's world, poker players are smart people from computer science to uh, you name it. They're playing this game. And 99.99% uh, and, and of them are playing very honest, straightforward game. And then there's those few that just muddy up the water so bad. Uh, we have to... Hopefully, I, I mean, I don't know how it works, like in the brick and mortar. It took a while, but I think it got cleaned up really nicely. Um, so the same thing has to happen online. It has to be clean. You just can't ever think of playing the game that there's a doubt in the back of your head that something is not right. How can you possibly play the game? How can you sit in the game and have a doubt that something may be fishy and play your game. You can't. It's, it's, it makes it very unpleasant. So um, we all have to come together as an industry, uh, make sure that there's, uh, there's enough security placed in the games, that there are no uh, questions that can't be answered coming from politicians, and then force you know, the inevitable to become uh, the reality. Poker uh, has become legal. Uh, I, mean, online, I mean, online poker. Obviously, uh, many yeah. of the states brick and mortar. I definitely agree with that. I think, um, yeah, the cheating stuff kind of does work and sort of like, does really hurt the whole image a lot. It's really hard for most people to see that because the cheating stuff just like blows up the media even like one little case and you know even though like countless transactions go smoothly um there's some term for this like silent information uh it's just really easy to think there's all this cheating going on or whatever that's not true that's an availability heuristic it's a bias um that that just seems really prevalent just because it's really easy to pay attention to those those like crazy a uh, one-off situations um and it's really easy to like think of them when you're running really bad and you don't know what's going on and that sort of thing it is it is too bad but um i do think you know the only thing you can do is to try to educate people and to try to like um reprimand people for doing the wrong thing i think people that do the right thing should be appraised a little bit more like no one really cares that much when people pay debts uh when they shouldn't and or not when they shouldn't, when, um, when it's very hard. Because it's kind of like, why are they even doing it? They're only doing it for the principle to just do the right thing. There's not even like, I mean, incentives are actually against paying debts uh, these days, which shouldn't be the case. But yeah, um, that's a big part of the fight for sure. I mean, I do think there's a lot of prejudice against poker players, and people just think, we're all gamblers, but it's not at all the case. Almost all the high-stakes players, especially that I know, or almost all the players that are successful are quite smart. And oh, 100%. I, I, can't, I am so proud of so many younger uh, kids that are playing. Uh, I, I just, I admire them so much. They are people of principle. And, and uh, every time I play with them, it, it just manifests itself very clear to me that these, these guys are good people playing good. And yet, uh, it, it's so painful to see, like you said, that one or two incidents, how far it puts them behind. Because if the game doesn't grow as fast, or even companies like ours that are, you know, so many people working so hard to put this game out there and if something like this happens, maybe the major sponsors won't look at poker. 
because, you know, they don't want to be associated. Why? Because that was the loudest noise that came out in 2022. Oh, this happened, that happened, you know, like, uh, and, and the other, you know, uh, million hands ever played uh, by, by complete, you know, like honest, good people nobody's talked about. That one or two, of course, it's going to be coming, coming out and just washing everything away. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a challenge that takes all of us uh, to overcome. And I, I agree that the poker players tend to be pretty good people for the most part. They're just kind of apathetic. That's my only qualm you could uh, claim with them, which I don't blame them for. That one's more understandable than a lot of issues with society. Uh, try to change that, but that's a little challenging also. Um, so uh, any, is there anything our viewers can look forward to, Maury, that uh, you want to tease well, them for? Of course. Uh, we are... Um they put plans for WSOP this year to stream every day. So look forward to uh, 45 days of nonstop streaming. All right. You, you, will, you will definitely get your, uh, uh, you know, you, <laughs> your satisfaction of watching tournaments uh, nonstop. So that's one plan. And, of course, uh, our own tour, PokerGo tour, uh, that, really in my opinion is uh, is as close as it gets crowning the greatest tournament player in the world and each december we doubled the price pulled the giveaway to a million dollars from five thousand so uh so basically it plays uh, very similar to pga et you have to qualify make the cut and 40 players that earn the most uh, points by playing all year round usually against the other tough players they qualify to play this so um uh, that that's that's always been fascinating to me to see it you know come together and um i i think no one can dispute that person you know yes i understand we, we all agree that you know it's still going to come down to 40 players playing uh, you know a very speedy structure over 3 days but to get there, to become one of the 40, they've played the entire year. So um, I want to say test of time has been there. And, and uh, winner is going to be definitely, my, in my book, the best player of the year. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm, uh, hopefully the viewers will uh, keep that in mind and uh, be ready for that one. And of course. Are you ready for the best tournament player of the year? There you um, go. Anything else you'd like to say before we uh, head out, Maury? No. Uh, well, poker has always been my life. And uh, uh, I I don't know how many years I'm going to be, uh, uh, you know, doing what I'm doing now. But I know for the rest of my life, I will cherish every moment of it. And uh, I just hope that everyone out there that's in the industry uh, give it all they have. This game is worth it. Thank you, Maury. Hope right. uh, the other poker players and the people who devote their lives to this game and make their living for the game listen to that and keep that in mind from someone who's truly uh, devoted to it. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Maury. Thank uh, you. It's great being with you.